Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey everyone, this is Ben Kaznoka, co-founder and partner here at Village Global. Very excited to have Brent Franzen on the podcast today. Brent is founder and CEO of a Village portfolio company, Most Days. Brent, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Ben. Tell us about Most Days. What's the vision? What are you up to? Yeah, so Most Days, I mean, I think the, the quick way to describe it would be as Peloton for mental health, but basically we're a life improvement platform that so we're a consumer app. We're calling ourselves a life improvement platform in which you can create or subscribe to routines. So routines would be a set of actions that roll up against some health goal. So if I'm suffering from anxiety, depression, I just want to be healthier, happier, there's a set of things I can mo- do most days to improve the, the quality and length of my life. It's nested within a social network. So I think real behavior change, I mean, what we see in the behavior change frameworks from from addiction and from other spaces is that it tends to be peer-to-peer accountability that drives behavior change. So everything's nested within a social network in which you can get accountability from the people who support you in your life. The third piece is just understanding progress over time. So just analytics and understanding how you're executing and trying to change the things you're doing um, on a regular basis to, to improve the quality of your life. So that's most days. And, and so what do you think are, the, are going to be some of the most popular routines that people use or people use to track? Yeah. So I, look, I think we're targeting out of the gate, we're spending a lot of time on behavioral health. So one of, the, one of the things that we have is we have experts who have authored routines on a variety of topics. So for example, we've got a neuroscientist who teaches down at UCLA and has written books on managing your life with depression. And so he has written a routine, again, set of things you can do most days. If you're struggling from depression, he's got a routine. He's written routines for people who can't get out of bed and are struggling with depression or people who are more functionally depressed. And so I think that the behavioral health categories that you would think of um, will be, I think will be popular. So depression, anxiety, uh, OCD, uh, addiction, sleep routines. And so especially given, I mean, these were, we, we were at kind of epidemic proportions for all of these, for all these kind of chronic health conditions prior to the pandemic. And so epidemic meets pandemic has created I'm a really bad situation for mental health. And then I think the other categories that we're seeing is just general wellness. So we're seeing a lot of people today on the platform who are, they wouldn't necessarily classify themselves as having an addiction or being depressed or high anxiety, but they want to improve their health. They want to improve their happiness. And there's a set of things that they're not doing that they want to be doing to um, to improve their lives. And so I think general wellness would be um, the other category. It's such an important mission. There's so many of us that uh, aspire to change our lives, change the world, become healthier and happier. People have all sorts of goals around meditation and sleep and eating better. But the truth is, unless you track those things, unless you have a plan for enacting that sort of behavior change, it's not going to happen. I mean, we all know people who've been talking about the same goal year after year after year and failing to achieve it. And so behavior change is really, really hard. What is sort of the magic of tracking these things and sharing them to achieve accountability with your peers? Because that's what most days is all about as a product that when I use it, I think about how I'm, I'm holding myself accountable to do a certain set of routines that contribute to a goal and my friends uh, can follow along and hold me accountable. And that seems pretty essential, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think we're borrowing from the behavior change frameworks in addiction. We've been inspired by behavior change frameworks that have been created in addiction. And so if you look at something like AA, if, if, if you don't know a lot about AA, it's this fascinating organization. But basically the core of AA, I, I really would, would take A and distill it into kind of three distinct pillars. One is 
there's a plan. It, there's the 12 steps in AA. If you walk into an AA meeting um, and they're going to tell you to get a sponsor and that sponsor is going to tell you to do a, a certain set of things each day. And these are pretty common across um, people who go to AA, but you, they want you to go to meetings and they want you to work the steps. They want you to be of service. There's a, there's a, there's a whole bunch of things that you do there. So there's, there's a plan that you're committing to as pillar one. Pillar two is really where all the magic happens, which is AA is really built around peer-to-peer accountability. So AA meetings are places where people can, can meet together who are on the same journey. They're in different places on the journey, but they're all seeking the same goal, which is sobriety. And they're sharing about their, their journeys. It's a, it's a place where it's okay to, to be vulnerable and kind of talk about the more difficult moments um, in your life that have, that have led you to walk into that room. And then the third piece is just understanding progress over time. So in AA, you get a chip. If you've been sober 24 hours or 40 years, you get, you get, kinda, you get these little coins along the way. And so really, my, my view is that that framework can be applied to anything. Addictions are so interesting because they're, they're gonna, the negative consequences of addiction, of addiction are created by behaviors that are repeated over and over again. And then the kind of quote-unquote cure, cure is not the right word, are, is changing those behaviors. It's not, you know, there are some medications, but typically people get themselves out of addictions just by changing the way that they behave. It's not a surgery and it's, it's not a pill. And so that's the framework that we're borrowing from, you know, that seems to work. I think, you know, I, I couldn't pinpoint exactly what the, what the magic of the peer-to-peer accountability is, but it, it's, it's very effective in that space. And so I think it can be effective for anything you're trying to do. You're building a consumer app around behavior change, both really hard things to do, right? Launching a new app in the app store or getting people to use it, that's a, it's a tall task for any entrepreneur, let alone an app designed to help people change some of the hardest habits in their life, really hard. So it's what you're doing with most days is incredibly ambitious, uh, but maybe that's not surprising given your own history and the fact that this is not the first company you've started. So maybe roll back the clock a little bit, Brian, tell us about your history as an entrepreneur and uh, the sorts of things you've done, the things you've learned along the way that gave you the confidence to tackle this kind of ambitious mission. Yeah, I mean, so so very quickly. So I'm almost, um, I'm 38, I'll be 39 soon. I started my first company when I was in high school. So it was a bootstrapped company. It's, a, it's an SEO business. Um, and I started before in the you know, late 90s before SEO was really was really a word. That, that business is still in existence today, but that's a service business. I then was on the, it's kind of the founding head of sales at a company called reputation.com, which was my first exposure to a venture back business. I had moved to Palo Alto and I ran um, the sales and BD teams there for about, for about seven years. Um, that was an interesting experience because at reputation, we had a high price consumer product, a low price consumer product. We had an SMB product. Ultimately, it's an enterprise business today. We had an enterprise product. And so very formative in kind of learning zero to something across a a bunch of different customer types. I then was the non-founding CEO of Euclid Analytics, a benchmark NEA backed uh, kind of fit real world analytics, be described as Google analytics for the physical world. I ran that business for from 2014 to 2019. And then we were acquired by WeWork at the beginning of 2019 and had an interesting year at WeWork. And then now I'm the founder and CEO of most days. So I think I've had a, a little bit of each. I was founder and CEO of a bootstrap company and then founding, you know, founding team, but not the uh, founding CEO of a venture back company, the non-founding CEO of a venture back company. And so um, I think the variety has been really helpful for me in understanding uh, in learning a lot about, you know, how you approach particularly new products and, and, and taking them to market. I think that zero to one is really where I, I love the intellectual challenge of it. And I think I've, and I, I've done it enough that it doesn't guarantee my success, but I think I've, I've learned a lot from it that I'm applying here. So I think the so what are some of my career has been helpful. Yeah. And what are the, some of those lessons uh, from these different chapters of your entrepreneurial career? Like if you had to summarize a couple of your key uh, takeaways, either from your successes or failures that inform your approach as an entrepreneur building most days, what would those be? 
Well, I, so I mean, there's so many, but if I, if I think back to the first two businesses, so I think back to the SEO business, I think back to reputation.com reputation in the early days, we had this just crazy product market fit and this crazy revenue growth. But at that time, it was the wrong kind of revenue. So I think the first les- lesson is not all dollars are created equal. So really, when you looked at that, at that revenue, basically what we were doing is we were creating and publishing content to help people with their search results. So we had doctors, lawyers, if people call and say, hey, there's something that's appearing in my search results that I don't like. And we were helping them mitigate the visibility of, of whatever they didn't like. And at the core, that was an interesting business and meeting a real need, but it was not the technology wasn't driving it enough for us to get the multiples that we would want on the revenue. And so that business ultimately transitioned into an enterprise business, a very, very interesting business today. Um, But I think this lesson of not all dollars are, are created equal is really important. And so, you, you know, I think there can be this tendency to take the, the kind of lower friction dollars that look a little bit more like service dollars, but hey, you're in the early stage, you're trying to do whatever you can to grow revenue. And if you get addicted to the wrong kind of revenue, it can be very hard to pull yourself out of that. Hey, it's, a, it's a great point. And I, I, someone along the way had the phrase good revenue, bad revenue, and it was exactly this point. And it's, it's particularly pronounced in the enterprise where enterprise sales and enterprise businesses where you have customers that will ask for custom stuff, right? Uh, and you can go and sort of have a, a custom service contract with somebody and, and build a cool feature for them and make some money off that. But that feature is utterly uninteresting to every other customer in your customer base. You know, is that good revenue or bad revenue? Probably bad revenue. Then there's also the difference between scale, revenue that's generated through scalable means, right, uh, versus just pure service revenue. And so, yeah, it's a really interesting phenomenon. One actually, as an aside, a slight counter argument to this line of thinking I saw recently, I think it was Chaitan from Benchmark, who's been on the podcast, uh, had a good tweet about Workday. And in the early days of Workday, they had a tremendous, you know, much more dependent on on service revenue, if I'm remembering this correctly, than they are today. And that sometimes you have to, it's just a reminder that in the early days of, of any company, including some of the most successful ever, like Workday, you often are doing whatever it takes just to keep the company alive and close those early accounts. And so that the nuance of, of, of how religious are you about good revenue versus, well, revenue is revenue at some level. And I just got to keep this company alive. That, that's the judgment that gets developed as an entrepreneur. Yeah, I agree with that. I think I think the learning I've I've applied to most days is at least at least starting from a place of how do we build a platform where the technology does all of the work and how do we have that focus and that mindset at the beginning and and I think as 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 we know as you build companies things get messier and you make decisions that optimize for some short term outcome because you don't have the luxury of thinking about a long term outcome in that moment and those decisions sometimes are the right decisions sometimes are the wrong decisions and in the case of reputation it, it wasn't necessarily the the wrong decision because you know, we had grown revenue to, uh, and we had, I mean, it was 40 or 50 million or something. And so we had a big team. It was a smart team. And eventually we put the right people around the table to transition that business into an enterprise business. A lot of that, a lot of that work, I'm going to start while I was there, but happened after I left. And so it's not that it was the wrong decision. I think the other piece too is the service oriented. I mean, at least at, re- at reputation, it was very, um, I know operationally complex in a way that I found really annoying. So I would rather be solving product and technology problems um, where the technology ends up doing the heavy lifting after you do the really hard thinking of what does the product need to look like and then building building the technology to solve that need. Then like, okay, you're constantly hiring more people and having and building process around like how the paper gets pushed between the people. I find that problem just personally to not not be as interesting and enjoyable. Totally. So now, so, so Brent, the mission that you're on today with most days um, around wellness and health uh, is personal to you. And one of the things that is so fascinating about entrepreneurship is uh, I find is the founders that are scratching their own itch versus founders that are scratching someone else's itch. And actually you can build a successful company in either. There are plenty of people who started a company where their mission was, I want to start a business and I'm just going to figure out where there's a market opportunity. And I don't care if that's has to do with, you know, auto parts or enterprise software or baking cupcakes or whatever the thing is, if there's a business opportunity, that's the one I'm going to start. And there's a different category of entrepreneurs who had have experienced a problem firsthand 
and it, it bugs them enough where they're like, I got to solve this. I got to make this cheaper, faster, better, whatever. Both can be successful. I tend to see people who are scratching their own itch be more passionate about what they're doing. They often are able to sustain their energy over a longer period of time because the mission is very personal to them. At the same time, by the way, people that scratch their own itch can sometimes become blinded by that very passion and be have a harder time pivoting a business if that's what's called for. So there's always pros and cons to these sort of the, these dynamics. But anyway, for you, Brent, uh, you've been thinking about health, wellness uh, for a long time. Um, so talk about what in your life informed the creation of most days and then what were you doing to sort of address your challenges pre most days that then gave rise to this, this, to this app. Yeah, sure. So I think I, there's a couple of things. So one is like many people, yeah, I've, I've had addiction around me in, in, in different ways. And so various people in my life who I have, who I have kind of witnessed struggling with addiction and struggling in the depths of, of despair of addiction and then um, kind of rising out of it and finding health and kind of ridding them, themselves of an, of an addiction. And then I've also been on my own personal journey. So I was this kid, I smoked pot really you know, excessively when I was in high school and early in my, my, basically my late teens and my early 20s. I stopped uh, smoking pot and then I found myself in this mode of like having a couple of drinks most night, most nights. So I'm in this category of I'm not ever at the risk of drinking to um, black, you know, to the point of blacking out. I'm not going to ruin my life. I'm not going to get up in the morning and drink. But I was in this mode of I was having a couple of drinks most nights and I didn't have full control of it. I'd kind of enter, you know, 3.30 or 4, I would say to myself, yeah, I sleep better when I don't drink. I'm not going to have those, those beers tonight. And then I would end up having them. So, you know, I've, I've described it as, and I think there's a lot of people in this gray area is having an unhealthy relationship with alcohol. And then I also just personally, I'm, I'm not in the category of saying, hey, I really struggle with depression or anxiety or, or, or something that's, that would be more clinically defined. But health, happiness, healthy routine. It doesn't come easy to me. I really have to have to work at it. And then it, it really culminated for me when as the CEO at Euclid, I had some situational anxiety. It was just, a, there was, there were stressful moments in, in the, in the job. And I was prescribed Klonopin, which is a, which is a benzo like Xanax. And that was great. It helped me sleep. It's very good situationally, meaning for just a short period of time. But the problem with with benzos um, and a lot of these the, the pre- prescription drugs of different types, actually for pain and for other things, is that they're highly ad- addictive. And so what happened was, I said, okay, now I need to get off of the benzos, and that proved really difficult for me. I, actually, I failed. I, so I I basically just stopped cold turkey, and I spent three weeks of just losing weight, not eating, not sleeping and gave up. I went back to the doctor and said, Hey, I got to get back on them. I got to find a better way to get off of these. And what I did, so through a bunch of Googling, I found this, this woman, a pharmacologist in the UK who had run a benzo withdrawal clinic in the mid nineties, woman named Dr. Heather Ashton. I think she's passed. She had written a the, the Ashton manual, which is basically a manual for, for getting off of benzos like Klonopin. And basically what it was is it's this daily tapering of the Klonopin, but you actually introduce volume, which is, has a kind of a shorter half-life. So the Klonopin comes down a little bit each day over about a six-week period. This whole thing's about six-week period. And then volume, you're introducing volume. And so then you're on this higher dose of volume and you drop off the Klonopin and then you, you reduce the volume. And so in doing that, I had I created this spreadsheet where I started tracking all of the things I was doing each day. So not only was I tracking the Klonopin and the, and the vibes, I was, and I was successful in doing that at work, but I was tracking, you know, I now track 45 things every day. So flossing, meditating. And what I've realized is the more of those things that I do or don't do, the whole, the system was really crazy. I had negative points and positive points. I built a little scoring algorithm. But what I've realized is the more that I, that I do the, the, the good thing that I sleep well, that I meditate, that I exercise, all these obvious things, the happier I am. I mean, my goal seek is, is happiness, the better that I feel. And so that system, you know, I've now been, been adhering to some form of that system for, I don't know, four, four or five years, been incredibly helpful for me. Hello, and- Brent, can I just ask, you mentioned sleep, exercise, eating, health, uh, eating well as obvious things. 
What are a couple of the most non-obvious of your 45 things that you track? Any, what are the non-obvious things that actually for you contribute to the, the goal of happiness? Yeah, I think they're mostly the basics. I think one, one thing that's non-obvious is I do these voice memos each day. And so I don't record a new voice memo each day, but, but I started a few years ago. I got a recommendation, I think from somebody who I was referred to from One Medical, but to do these, these voice memos. Interesting. So basically, about once a month, I will, I will record myself stating, making a statement um, related to some issue that I'm having. So recently I have, um, you know, I don't need to rescue others. So I tend to, I tend to be a pleaser. I like to say yes to people. I like, I want people to like me. I, you know, I want to make, I want to make people happy and that can create a whole host of, of, of issues for me. And so I record myself saying among four or five other things, Hey, you you know, I don't need to rescue others. And then I will listen to that recording and state those things back to myself. And I will, I will listen to the recording four times. And what's interesting about that process is if you do that enough, you do that long enough, you find that you just stop doing those things. And so that's power in the voice. That's a non-obvious. Yeah. It's super interesting. Is there power in the voice part of that? Like there are probably some people that write down mottos, slogans, affirmations, incantations of some sort written down, is hearing your own voice say it at a level of power? I think, I mean, I think it's a negative power at first. I, I don't like hearing the sound of my own voice. And so you have to get over that. You get over it quickly. I think it's stating it emphatically that has more power for me than listening to it. So I listen to it and then part part of what I'm trying to do is state it out loud emphatically. And I think the power comes from there, A, and then B, it's very simply just top of mind. So now when I'm going through my day and something comes up where I would go into that pattern of rescuing somebody, it's very easy to remind myself, oh yeah, I don't need to do that and move on. So I think the top of mind nature of it's helpful as well it's the recording of the voice memos that that's the powerful thing less the, the playback uh, that makes sense okay so so you had you you were you had some some health and wellness challenges of your own one of the ways that you coped with that is creating this sort of massive spreadsheet which i feel like there are a bunch of people in the quantified self world that have i have another friend who has a spreadsheet and not only does he track habits but he ranks like his happiness 1 through 10 every day and different times of the day and that sort of thing uh, it's very elaborate, very comprehensive. And so I, I, it sounds like that spreadsheet was the analog version of some sense uh, of uh, most days. I think so. I mean, I, what I realized is I don't think there are that many of us who want to fill out 45 habits each day and score them and one to 10, how are you feeling? I think, you know, maybe on the spreadsheet that I created, I'm a market of one, but it really figuring out a way to change the things I was doing most days had a dramatic impact on the quality of my life. And I had also seen this in addiction. I've spent a lot of time in therapy. I'm a very introspective person. And so it really coalesces around this idea that we can all, with a different set of behaviors, improve the quality of our lives by you know, doing some certain set of things most of the time. And then I started exploring really deeply in behavioral health and spending a lot of time talking to to experts in that space. And it's just very clear that there's a need here to really simply help people understand, okay, based on whatever you're suffering from or whatever your health goal is, what's a set of things you can be doing that's going to improve the quality or length of your life? And so and what is, is a what personal is passion. If, but if I were to, if I, if we would have productized my spreadsheet, I think I'd, I'd be out of business really quickly. Yeah. It'd be a small number of users. Yeah. Well, I think you're, you're making it more mass market and accessible, which is, which is great. What, what do you think is the explanation behind the knowing doing gap? I mean, there, there are so many people who know what they need to do to be healthier and happier, but are failing to do the thing they know they ought to do. What in the research that you've done and the folks you're talking to and ha- how you're building the most app, most days app, uh, what's, what's your sort of current working hypothesis about what people need to be doing differently to actually make good on the goals that they have? Yeah. So, well, I think there's two pieces. So one, I think there, there is this notion. So you'll talk to a certain group of people that say discoverability is not the problem. So we all know what we need to be doing. And 
I don't fully agree with that. Um, I think we know some basics of what we need to be doing, but if you are somebody who is struggling from anxiety and hasn't really tried to attack that behaviorally, I think there are some things that are breathing techniques and other things that might be obvious to people who have spent time trying to figure that out who are not going to, that are not going to be obvious to you at first. So for me in my journey of trying to figure all this out for myself, all of these things are obvious to people who know a lot about this space that they weren't obvious to me at the beginning. And I was on this self-guided journey and, and they're hugely helpful to me today. So I think there is some value in packaging up at the individual um, health issue level, a set of things you can be doing and, and making those things easy to do. So there's the discoverability piece, which I think is important. And then the second piece, which is the divide you're talking about, which is like, okay, I know the things I need to be doing. And then it's, it's very difficult to do those things. I think it's a question of motivation. I think it's a question of accountability. I think what drives people, it's, it's different to the person. I'm somebody who likes to get credit and points for the things that I do. And not everybody, not everybody's like that. And so, but I think it comes down to, like, I mean, in, in addiction, you would, you would call this rock bottom. I think for me, there's a, there's a saying that I have. I quit smoking cigarettes. Yeah, I started smoking cigarettes in college, and I don't smoke cigarettes in my early 20s. I haven't had a cigarette in 15 years. But um, where I said, you know, don't quit quitting. You know, and I, I kind of took this approach of, okay, I'm going to keep failing at this, but if I don't quit quitting, I will eventually quit. And so I think that the, the primary issue in my mind, and this is why the company is named Most Days, is it just feels unachievable. It feels like I'm not going to do it. I tried to do the thing and I didn't do the thing and I'm not going to do it. And if we step back and we're just a little bit more compassionate with ourselves and we say, hey, it's, I'm, I'm a human being. I'm not going to be perfect. I had an off day. Tomorrow's a new day. And you really think about those small changes that compound over time. I think that's where it becomes very, very accessible. But I think we can, we can play this loop in our heads of, I'm not going to be able to do it. I haven't been able to do it. And you kind of, you let that get get the best of you. So if I had to pinpoint one thing, it's probably a lack of self-compassion and thinking about it as a much kind of bigger goalpost, at least than it is on a daily basis. These tiny, small little changes that compound over time. I think it's a really interesting idea and I can see it from multiple angles. So on the one hand, I love the the name most days and I love the idea of be, have self-compassion. You won't be perfect every single day. It, it reminds me of the Jerry Seinfeld productivity method, don't break the chain, which I don't know if Seinfeld actually practiced it. It's what it's called in productivity circles where you 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 put an X through every box in the calendar when you write a joke or uh, write 500 words or whatever your sort of creativity objective is and then don't break the chain. So every day you got to do X, 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 X. And once you see them pile up, you'll never want to miss a day because it'll look so grating visually to see that chain broken. And I see this in meditation a lot, a community that I'm, I'm pretty involved with where people will say, I've meditated, you know, 223 days in a row. And that makes it very uh, compelling to want to meditate for the 224th day in a row. Um, uh, the problem is, is once you break the chain and it's inevitable, it happens to all of us, then you lose a ton of motivation and it's very hard to get back on the horse. And so I find the all in all or nothing approach dangerous with respect to self-help and wellness. And I'm, I'm not a fan of don't break the chain. I am a fan of trying to do things most days. Uh, so I love the name. The only flip side, Brent, that I, I think is interesting given your own history and the learning that you're taking from the addiction community is in the case of addicts, right, isn't the whole point that it's all days. It's not don't drink six out of the seven days and have a beer on Sunday. It's it's cold turkey altogether, right? And so there's a sort of extreme version of this that's for addiction, whereas in the general wellness space, like exercise, you don't have to exercise seven days a week, just exercise, you know, four to seven days a week. And if you skip a whole week because you're traveling or feeling sick, no big deal. Whereas in addiction, right, if, if, if I have a drug problem or an alcohol problem and I just say, hey, this week I'm going to drink, but I promise then the week after I'll stop again, isn't that frowned upon? Uh, so a couple of things. So one, addiction, of course, you want continuous sobriety. And there are a lot of, there are a lot of people who would identify as addicts and, and who, are, who, are, who are clinically addicts who 
can't have a drink. They, they can't use. They need that continuous sobriety. But even in addiction, the, the mindset is one day at a time. And so, and the thinking is, if you think about, oh my gosh, I'm 38 and I've got to be sober for the rest of my life, that the weight of that is going to topple you and you're set up for failure if you think that way. And so break it into small pieces. Hey, and, and, and you'll talk to people who have been sober 10 years and they still, they still kind of think, they still kind of talk this way, at least in their own, the way that they talk to themselves is, hey, you know, maybe I'll have a drink tomorrow, but I'm not going to have a drink today. And they wake up more in, every, every day with that attitude. And so, but yes, addiction is different than most of the other you know, wellness areas or, or habit formation areas in which it's very important to string together a lot of those days. But I think the, and, and so, and I agree with your points on, on streaks, I think being counterproductive. My mother has done over a thousand days of yoga in a row and I love her and it's amazing, but with all due respect and love, it, it, she's kind of a freak, you know, like that's not all of us. I, I think I will die without ever having done a thousand days of yoga in a row. So I think it's, it's less about how long do you stay on the horse and it's more about getting back on the horse. Hey, if you are trying to work out three days a week or four days a week or whatever it is, and then you have a bad week, you want to be rewarding yourself mentally for just getting back out there, not chastising yourself for the fact that you had a bad week. And so I think when, you can, when you've got this don't quit quitting mentality of, hey, it's just about getting back out there. It's not that I missed. It's not that I fell off in some way. It's about get batting on. And I think that's even true in addiction. I mean, when you, when you talk to people who have struggled with addiction, it doesn't take the first time typically, you know, they, they go in and out of the rooms as they might say in a, or they kind of struggle with it on and off. But if you don't quit quitting, I think you'll get there. And I think it's, it's the right mindset um or it's it's yeah. a, there's no perfect mindset but it's, I it's think a the one mindset yeah one day at a time is a, is a great philosophy for all of us it also reminds me of um uh getting back on the horse reminds me of a saying in buddhism which is begin again you know there's yeah. this continual failure to be present failure to focus on your breath failure to uphold whatever principle of buddhism that you might be striving for but you just have to begin again and you know if you sit for an hour at a meditation session and the and say you have as an object of concentration, the breath, your mind will wander. And uh, what the great meditation teachers always say is, don't be harsh on yourself when you observe that your mind has wandered. That's actually a moment of waking up when you, when you notice the fact that your attention has drifted. That actually is a glimpse at enlightenment. And then just gently bring the attention back to the breath and begin again. And that idea of begin again at the micro meditation level really feels like a theme that informs so much of your work and habit and wellness front. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's, there's no easier way to, you know, to ruin a meditation session than to just sit there and beat yourself up because your, your mind is wandering. Um, I mean, I feel like in the guided meditations that I do and I do, I, I, I practice, I do 10 minutes a day, but I've been doing that for five or six years is I do the Sam Harris, I do the Sam Harris meditations, but there's this moment of saying, okay, now don't worry about what you think about. Just think about, you know, whatever you want. And that's often the moment when I'm like most present, right? Is that's when so I'm interesting. Most, it's like the most compassionate with myself. So I, I actually, I, I love Sam Harris's work and I love his book, Waking Up, highly, highly recommend it. And I have the Waking Up, Waking Up app, but there's a version, there's a section of his meditation where he says, just think about whatever you want. And those are the moments when actually it's most easy for you to, to be present with the breath. Yeah. There's this moment of like, okay, just like drop all trying, you know, and like, just let you, let your brain do whatever it wants. And then I find I'm like, wow, I'm in this clear open air and all of the thoughts that have been, that have been racing around in my head, they're suddenly ceasing. That's fascinating. I want to, uh, I want to linger on another version of wellness and health habits. I'm so, so interested in the non-obvious things that people do to be healthier and happier, especially if they're relatively accessible to folks. One, one passion that you and I uh, share is, is sauna. And uh, you've talked about your history with sort of heat exposure. And I'm not sure actually how much cold exposure you've done. And you mentioned a, a few minutes ago about breath work or breathing Um how did you, when did you first get into sauna? Um, and, uh, how has it helped you? And do you have a take on heat and cold and cold plunging? And, and then I'm happy to share, you know, my experience with it as well. 
Yeah. So, so I would, I would put it into this category of things that have been important for me, which is I view them almost as forced meditation. So how can you put yourself into environments in which you have no choice but to focus on, on something singular? And so these are experiences for me that are intense experiences. So I, I spent a lot of time skydiving to find this state. So skydiving is for the minute that you're in free fall, um, you're not thinking about anything else. You're not thinking about the email you haven't responded to or, you know, whatever argument that you wish you, you know, you had said something differently. And I found that, I, I think I sought that out for, for a long time um, and, and spent a lot of time in that space because it, it was a form of meditation in, in which it's very hard to have those racing thoughts that you have when you sit down. And I think that, heat therapy and cold plunges for me are similar. And so I really, you know, there's this uh, Russian bathhouse in San Francisco, you know, that's open when it's, when it's not a pandemic that, ha- you know, it's, it, it has all of the above. And I started spending time there when I, when I was just very high anxiety, I would go and, you know, before board meetings, or I remember I was raising money and I had a, I was pitching the benchmark partnership for a like uh, just a, f- they were they were participating in the round, and I couldn't get my mind off of the anxiety of okay, I got to walk in there tomorrow morning. It's an it's an intimidating group, and if I go and the ten minutes that I'm sitting in that two hundred degrees in the sauna at Banya, or I'm sitting in the forty five degree cold plunge, I'm just I'm not thinking about whatever is nagging at me, and. So hugely, hugely helpful for me for my mental for my mental state of mind. And then you start to look at the research specifically around sauna and cold plunge, and it just has all these crazy health benefits. Um, yeah, I think the the con- the the contrast between he- heat and cold is really powerful, and so much in life, you know, happiness and joy, but also sadness, anger, grief, depression, uh, the thrill and terror. I imagine of jumping out of an airplane. I haven't done, I haven't done skydiving before. Um, uh, but then also the sense of relief upon being safe and the and uh, and and secure that 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 contrast, especially when they're so closely together in, in time, uh, is incred- incredibly powerful. Um, and I think the, the thing I'm always intrigued by is when there are habits or traditions that humans have been practicing for hundreds or thousands of years all around the world, and yet for some reason. I or my social network or my culture or my country hasn't uh, hasn't discovered yet. And I think sweating in the heat is an example of something that is a tradition and a habit that's has actually had a long history around the world in many different sorts of cultures, but for whatever reason is is relatively undiscovered in America. Um, similarly, uh, cold exposure is another thing that that has been more popular elsewhere than here. And that always to me, because, you know, humans are sort of, we share more common with each other than, than different. That's usually a function of just some, fi- some cultural transmission failure that hasn't arrived in our shores yet, but there's probably lessons to be had. And so when the Turks and the Russians and the Finns and the Native Americans and all these people over all these years have had sweat lodges and banyas and sauna, it, there's probably a lesson there that, hey, there's, there's goodness. This, this can be a key to, to happiness and health. Yeah, I mean, I I totally agree, and I think that's probably, you know, we're we're in a fortunate position that that's probably the thing I've missed most from the during the pandemic. I'm a bit of an introvert, and I've got my my family and and kind of the 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 people who are really close around me, so I'm so I'm lucky in that way, and I'm able to work remotely. But man, you know, in those moments where I'm having an off day. Um, and I just need a restart. I used to work near a place where I could get to a sauna very quickly and easily. And it was just a beautiful restart for me. And, and now I don't have that. So it's, um, what do you know about breath work or breathing? Have you looked into like Wim Hof and these other frameworks? You know, so it, what's funny is if you spend enough time just like hacking at yourself, you end up, you end up like, arriving on these whole areas of knowledge that, you know, people have already done tons of work around. So I was really into, so I grew up in Colorado and I loved, I would always find my way into these cold bodies of water when I was growing up. And I realized that if the more I could slow my breathing, the longer I could withstand it. So, you know, you jump in cold water and you go, 
you know, that is actually going to make you feel a lot colder than if you just force yourself to take these really deep breaths. And it turned into a little bit of like a party trick in high school. My friend, I'd, I'd show my friends it was all good. I could slow my breathing down and stay in the cold water. And then you realize, you know, Wim Hof, there's a whole, you know, like he has dedicated his life to breathing techniques and, and kind of um, withstanding cold conditions. So I haven't spent a lot of time uh, as a student of his work. I think my cursory understanding, I'm familiar with it just experientially. And then the same is true, I think, with sauna and skydiving. A lot of that is rooted in, you know, there's some kind of stoic angles to that, which is, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a part of uh, stoicism that really focuses on kind of practicing being in uncomfortable situations so that you've, um, so that you've got more muscle in that area for, for it, when those situations might naturally arise. And I remember, you know, if you're, if you're in a meeting with intimidating people or you're in some difficult work situation, thinking like, oh, kind of sitting on the plane, you know, about to jump out for a skydive, like that's actually like, that's actually scarier. And you've got that context that can kind of bring you into a more present and relaxed state. And so, um, but I'm I'm not like classically schooled in it. Like I, I, I couldn't go deep with you on stoicism or Wim Hof. Winhoff, I'm, I'm I'm just learning more about now. I'm actually reading a book called The Wedge by Scott Carney, which is kind of interesting. About um, it's about Wim Hof and other of his pursuits uh, in the realm of of sort of uh, human resilience amidst stress. Uh, so, for example, he goes on a tour of these Latvian saunas and and how the the people there like push your body to the very edge of heat, and then you have the cold exposure, then come back to the edge, and so he has these sort of different it's kind of like Tim Ferriss esque uh, self experimentation and sort of being a guinea pig. Um, but it's, it's pretty interesting. I think on the breath work stuff, there's a, I, we had a, a village globally hosted this um, small event for some of our founders. And I was amazed that out of the 25 people there, like 14 people are familiar with Wim Hof and breath work stuff. So I, it seems to be becoming more and more popular, but yeah, the punchline on, on the breath work stuff for me so far is, uh, deep breaths are far more powerful in terms of relaxation than shallow breaths. Many of us only breathe shallow breaths or mostly breathe shallow breaths. Uh, and so breathing through your nose and taking these deep uh, inhales and a slow exhale is a very powerful way of, of uh, controlling your, you know, your mood, your, your anxiety. Um, and I think if you do so in a really systematic way per the Wim Hof method, you can achieve all sorts of, you know, you can hold your breath for 18 minutes. There's, there's reports of people pretty amateur in the tradition, but you know, you previously can only do 25 push-ups, and now you can do, you know, 85 push-ups in a row. Uh, just little things like that. Like our body is actually remarkably pliable. It, it appears. Yeah. I mean, the, the Wim Hof stuff's interesting. We don't need to go too far. I had a buddy who went to Poland and, you know, did whatever you can do a week with Wim Hof. And so you just spend all this time in these cold plunges. And then like the climax of the week was, you know, in the middle of the winter, they walked to the, you know, they, they hiked to the top of the tallest mountain in, I think it's Poland without, a, just with shorts and boots on. And so it's certainly, it's kind of, they're great stories at the very least, but totally well, and, agree with you on breath work. So uh, just to, to sort of close, I'll say that uh, if you haven't downloaded most days yet, you should download the app and uh, you can begin tracking your routines. One of the routines that I track uh, in most days is taking a cold shower. Uh, if you don't have the space for your own sauna or don't have access to a sauna because we're in the middle of a pandemic or don't have a cold plunge, um, start with cold showers. That's a really easy way to begin to experience some of the benefit of uh, of cold therapy. And uh, I found uh, tracking this in uh, most days to be really helpful. So you can check out the app in the app store, uh, let Brent know uh, feedback on your experience. And uh, Brent, thank you so much for uh, sharing the most days vision with us. We're excited to have you in the portfolio and look forward to uh, what's to come. Yeah. Yeah. Excited to be here. And, and I would say if, you know, I'm, we're trying to build a technology to help people improve the quality of their lives. So if you're struggling with something or you've got questions or you've got feedback, reach out. I mean, we're trying to build a company to help people. So please just reach out on Brent at mostdays.com. Thanks so much. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Check us out at villageglobal.vc.